This is a great honor for me to talk to my guru, uh, Mengyu Rinpoche. I think, you know, for anybody who is interested in Buddhism and uh, especially the modern or contemporary scientific logical interpretation of Vajrayana, there are very few people who don't know Mingyur Rinpoche. But for those uh, who have not yet got the opportunity to know him, I would very briefly uh, like to introduce Rinpoche uh, <clears throat> as a great guru, contemporary guru. He is the youngest son of a very, very well-known uh, uh, Buddhist guru, Tulku Urgen Rinpoche. Uh, he is a very, very strong lineage holder. And uh, while saying this, I feel a little bit proud also that he was born in Gorkha, Northern Gorkha. Thank you again, Rinpoche, for allowing us to uh, talk to you. If I may ask you uh, a few questions. In the very beginning of our interaction, as a guru and his disciple, you had told me something very, very important about refuse, taking refuse. Yeah. You had told me that taking refuse in Buddha means actually taking refuse in the Buddha inside you. The Gurus, all the uh, Sangha Mitras, al Mitras, even Shakyamuni Buddha himself, they only help you to show the way towards the Buddha inside you. When I heard this from you, that was almost a life changer for me. It was so empowering. So could you, for the benefit of everybody, could you again elaborate the same thing? Right. Yeah, so <clears throat> what Buddha Shakyamuni normally emphasize about, what he said is that you are the master of yourself. Nobody you are the, nobody is your own master. So what Buddha mentioned is we all have wonderful nature. Our true nature is the, uh, what we call Buddha nature, Skata Garba. And from the Buddha nature point of view, no matter who you are, the essence is same. The essence of Buddha Shakyamuni, essence of all the Buddha, an essence of all beings, humans, animals, what we call six realms, all are same. The fundamental nature is wonderful. But the problem is, Buddha recognized, we are not recognized. So normally, the traditional example is what we call, if there's a diamond under somebody's home, and that person not recognized, his or her own diamond. Even though that person owns the diamond, maybe big diamond like this, 10 kilos of diamond. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the diamond cannot be benefit for that person because that person not recognized. Once that person recognized, then that person life completely changed. The benefit of the diamond really manifest for that person. But uh, the person it's already rich from beginning. It's not become richer. Same thing with the, all of us. So it is really important that we all can become just like Buddha. Not the just follower like Buddha or 
retinue of Buddha or servant of Buddha. We can become Buddha, just like Buddha. But how to do that? Through the practice, through the Dharma. The Buddha said, I can show you the path. Whether you are fully become Buddha or not is in your hand. And Buddha cannot give us power. If Buddha can give us power directly, then we will not have pandemic now. <laughs> we have a lot of problem in the world, isn't it? It cannot remove like this from our side. But we have to make our own effort. Follow the Dharma. We can become like Buddha. While talking about this potential, this limitless potential within right. human beings, a question comes to my mind. Right. Uh, it's, it's true that we do have that potential which still needs to be unfolded. Yeah. And uh, uh, Buddha taught the way right. to, to unfold these potentials. Right. It seems that we, the human beings, uh, feel more comfortable mining our uh, black or dark <laughs> potentials. Instead of looking the goodness within yourself, right. we are so f trained to look for the you know, evil in others. Right. Maybe because of this reason, right. I have heard sometimes that you know, people who are interested in Buddhism right. from a distance, right. they have to do some, some curiosity. Right. But without understanding the essence, right. they are always trying to find fault. Right. And they say that, okay, good tax aside, but in practice we see that there is so much of hierarchy right. in Vajrayana. And in, uh, they have said that you know, Vajrayana seems to be uh, the path of the elites, right. uh, not of the general people. Right. Uh, I have my own answer to me, right. but what would you say right. to people who are saying this? Right. The Vajrayana flourish in the Tibet. So, of course, it comes from India and Nepal. Uh, teaching come to Tibet. So, in the Tibet, the, the Guru is not like God or not like a father or not like a mother. It is to project your true nature, the Buddha nature. And to appreciate Buddha nature, first you project on the teacher, the quality of the Buddha nature. And then Guru Yoga meaning, first you project the, your enlightened nature, the Buddha nature, on the Guru. Then second, oh, not only Guru is Buddha, student also Buddha. Project to yourself ah, to understand. Actually, there is the same thing. Third, not only student, all beings, and that include not just human, all the realm, animals. Everybody has that true nature. So that is what we call Guru Yoga. But uh, of course, sometimes the teaching come to the outside of Tibet and then culture mix and there is um, some places uh, the habit of the one kind of like focus on maybe like one in one family there's a father or mother is head right in one company there has to have one head and in the religious also there's one man in charge the that's our habit normally in human. So at the project on that, then there's a lot of culturally made as um, their own guru. Culturally made as Buddha as kind of a hierarchy. But in the teaching, it's different. So as you mentioned about our humans, normally has uh, what we call, as I mentioned before, diamond. And diamond has a, what we call obscuration, obscure to nature. So obscuration has two layers. Outer layer, which is unhealthy, 
inner layer is healthy and the essence is beyond so three things there so outer layer is based on what we call ignorant not knowing the diamond not knowing our true nature so what is our true nature Buddha nature has three quality first empty beyond concept beyond subject and object but not nothing there is clarity awareness love and compassion so this clarity love and compassion awareness is one with the empty so that is the our true nature but then not recognize just the obscuration the outer obscuration is the ego you know picking the point mm-hmm. so even scientists said if we have 10 qualities within us what we see is if there's 10 quality nine is positive one negative and no matter what we see is only negative one and not only seeing the one negative we exaggerate that one so we ignore nine good qualities within us actually there's a lot of good qualities within us is manifesting every day but we think every every year it's getting worse the world is getting worse <laughs> Yes, Mr. Bajji, you know, what you have described just now, what you have explained, it, it has got, you know, it leads to so many, you know, other realizations. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, before going to, you know, other questions, I would like to ask, when you are saying that the projection the, of the Buddha nature on the Guru, it reminds me uh, of some, you know, some conversation with my artist friends and some writer friends, poets. Uh, while talking to them, I have a feeling that it's always very, very difficult to uh, express in words the real feeling that you are getting what you feel, what you experience, what you think, even what you think. It cannot be expressed even in your own native language. So when there, this difficulty arises, then these artists, these poets, these musicians, they try to find a way yeah. to express the things that is not expressed in words. Yeah. So when you were talking about this wonderful, unlimited Sugata Garva, this Buddha nature within you, there is no way to express it in words. So then, you know, one of the ways to do that is the Guru Yoga. First, project that. That, that immenseness, that openness, that clarity, that emptiness, that potential to the Guru. Right. Watch it, feel it, then it start going inside. Yeah. So it is all, you, can this also be understood as a very, very, uh, very high form of art when we are doing all, the, all these Vajrayana yeah, rituals. Of course. So in Vajrayana, there's two things, the path, wisdom and skillful means. So wisdom is the emptiness. So Buddha nature is emptiness. The method, the skillful means, is Guru Yoga also, loving kindness, compassion, and Bodhicitta also, the shamatha, the awareness also, and also the deity practice. It's kind of an art, exactly what you said, to express, to connect with that, our fundamental nature, the Buddha nature, through uh, imagination, a lot of creative ways. So for example, there's a lot of rituals there, but the meaning of ritual, when we imagine the deity we have to require concentration awareness so that is shamatha and the deity is emptiness like moon reflection in the lake 
that is vipassana and purpose is to help to other beings that's the method loving kindness compassion buddhicitta and not only that the deity represents our true nature the buddha nature so sometimes i make joke buy one get three or four free <laughs> so this is the the bhajana method skillful method to how to connect our true nature to different aspect of practice so i was just wondering where if we are aware of the reality as it is uh, i mean the the uh, relative reality <coughs> as it is uh, th- that means that you are not constructing anything you are not creating anything you are not adding or subtracting anything you are just uh, being aware of the things as it is as it is yeah is it possible that if you are just in shamata mm. or that awareness of the things mm. around you mm. and within you mm. this very awareness will this in itself start inviting compassion and wisdom mm. so i was just wondering if somebody is not doing very very difficult or you know uh advanced meditational practice right. just being in shamatha truly being in shamatha right. will that itself bring uh compassion and wisdom yeah or not so only shamatha cannot bring the wisdom but shamatha with the skillful means how shamatha lead to the vipassana lead to the insight can for example one of the shamatha meditation in our tradition is being with the breath watching the breath and we need to learn how to be with the reality as it is this is very important because normally we have monkey mind and exaggerating so people has worry the scientists said 99% of worry will not come but we exaggerate and then we deny the reality but if you want to learn how to see the reality clear we have to start one beginning one point so we can start with the breath and the emphasis is seeing the breath as it is meaning shallow breath is okay deep breath is okay irregular is okay painful breath is okay peaceful breath is okay we are not doing the breathing exercise just being with the breath as it is that is the beginning of wisdom accepting reality as it is at the same time bear with the reality it is at the beginning and of course at the beginning reality may not be smooth <laughs> lord up and down is changing 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 impermanent so many different pieces multiplicity and they are connecting each other interdependent then what happened we have a lot of bala 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 yet a lot of thought comes oh i forget about my work oh to do list i have a lot of list oh i delayed you know in nepal we delayed a lot you know? <laughs> and oh you know worry about the family worry our work worry about the life all this comes when these things comes what we do normally two things whether we lost in that or we fight with that normal i give example like in nepal we have dal bath right so when we being with the breath if dal bath comes normally we have two choice we lost in dal bath or we say no dal bath breathing no dal bath then what happen we think more about dal bath <laughs> when we say no then mind does opposite but when we really want to think about dal bath then dal bath disappear like if you go to exam i need to prepare all the answers and as soon as if you enter the exam hall mind become empty <laughs> you will not remember and finish exam time come out of exam hall oh remember but too late so that's the what we call the monkey mind 
So when we be with the breath, if Dalbath come, let it come. Very important. But the second important is, check whether do I still remember breath or not. If you still remember breath, you're not lost. But you can have Dalbath. So that is the letting go of craving, letting go of attachment. At the same time, we develop wisdom. Wisdom is knowing the reality as it is. Then slowly, slowly we back to ourselves, our body, our feeling, our mind, and all phenomena. Then the wisdom comes together through the shamatha. So vipassana, shamatha in the end become one. But uh, being a very lay person and uh, you know, listening to you, what I understand, Hugh, is that the starting point or starting being aware of some s object, which we call shamada in that you know technical language, that will start making your mind focused on something. When you start vipassana in, within that focus, when you start seeing it deeply, then you start seeing, oh, it's so impermanent, it's, it's ever-changing. So maybe that will help you understand that somebody had told me some, something bad, he was not very kind to me, uh, and I took it very seriously. But now I start seeing that, okay, that's, that will not remain there uh, like that forever. That is also changing. And my sensitivity towards what he said will also changing. It has already started changing. So just understanding that changing, ever changing behavior of, you know, everything that we witness through our sensations, uh, uh, that's going to change, that will not remain there forever. So I need not be really very serious about that, and that will help me to be, you know, slightly free from my pain, suffering. So the lessening of my pain, of my suffering, has already started when you start being aware. And if you start being aware of how you are feeling the things that you don't like, if you are able to think that, okay, other persons may also don't like it. They also don't like to be uh, scolded. They don't like to be punished for something. So I need to be really compassionate towards them. And with all these things, uh, slowly, I will rise to the wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, can I say that? Yeah. yeah. So actually, this simple practice, like, <clears throat> like just being with the breath, actually we are learning the entire life skill, how to work with our life successfully, meaningfully. So the most problem in our life, what happened? We don't see reality very clear. We don't see the situation very clear. We just act on our impulses, act on our past habit, a lot of traumas there, act on what people say. And then that creates a lot of misunderstanding, that create communication problem, create a um, problem between you and your boss you and your workers, you and your staff, you and your family members, your friends. All these are based on misunderstanding actually. And, uh, and we don't see first, if you don't see reality clear, that's the biggest mistake. <laughs> Ignorant first. So, but just thinking that I want to see reality clear, I want to see reality clear, it helps. But again, it's like, I don't want to think about Dalbat, I don't want to think about Dalbat, then more Dalbat comes, or I need answer, I need answer, and answer disappear, same thing. So we need to learn from the experiential way how to see things as it is. So the technique is the breath. 
breath at the beginning is not so strong. We cannot learn this with your family members. At the beginning, it's very difficult <laughs> to listen, to develop listening with the family members. Sometimes, when you love the most, you hate the most. <laughs> then we become out of control. But listening with our breath is easy. Breath is a neutral object. So we listen to our breath. At the same time, we let go of aversion. Like nowadays, many people have stress. Stress comes from aversion. As soon as if you try to avoid, try to push away something, then that object becomes stronger. That object becomes unpleasant. And dep depression also, especially in the youth. Nowadays, there's a lot of depression problem around the world. And low self-esteem, like I'm worthless, I'm not good, I'm not good enough also. And the panic, I had panic when I was young. Panic also comes from aversion. When you try to get rid of something, then the panic becomes stronger. And the relation problem also. At the beginning, maybe there's a lot of expectations of our relationship, perfect relationship. I want to have number one, then that create a lot of misunderstanding and cannot accept others' problem. Everybody has a problem. You should accept that. But if you, our mind too tight, we cannot accept that. And that not only the relationship, also your work, everyday life. If your mind too tight, you may a lot of problem. But when we, what we call let it go, but don't give up. So we all have great qualities. We all have Buddha nature. There's awareness, love and compassion, wisdom, skills, potential, capacity. A lot of things are within all of us. Try best to use them. Use your own wisdom, your own capacity. The best power is within ourselves. Like, there's a lot of teachings normally in our lineage. The wisdom is the best power. Love and compassion is the best power. Awareness is the best power. Like in Tibet, in the many years before, there's one king really want to help everybody, generosity. And a lot of barley, you know, barley, grain. Mm, yeah. He give to everybody and in Tibet they make barley as food, zamba. Uh. But then after a few months later, all the barley is gone and they need food again. And one of them, a minister said, mm, we teach them how to plant barley. So their wisdom stays within them then they can make their own barley. And they did that, they trained all the people. So in the end, the knowledge of how to plant barley saved the entire country. So that wisdom is the important. Another example is, I have one student in Indonesia and their family business, make shoe. And the father owns the company but then father is a little bit getting old and he don't know how he cannot take care of everything finally he gave it to the son and they have walked about 1000 people works at that company and he tried so many things but the company is getting die you know it doesn't work very well and he asked me what should I do and I I told him first you watch your breath and see what are the cause and conditions to have that breath. There are so many pieces there, what we call multiplicity. And they are connecting each other, interdependent. And there's a time, you have to wait for time. He said, yeah, good idea. He went back to his shoe company. See all the different factors. So many different causes and conditions there. Normally, we don't look cost condition, we just look at the result. Good company, successful, now, tomorrow. <laughs> then if we don't see the, on the ground level, so many cost condition, then the company will collapse. For example, if you plant um, apple, we have to think about soil, water, fertilizer, sunlight, time, um, seed, all these small things, put together, interdependent, 
Then we have wait for time. It's change impermanent. Then result surely follow. It definitely will have result. That is the most powerful one. We are following the, the law of the nature, the most powerful law. So we can learn that through our breath. If we, this, if we apply this in our life, life becomes successful and meaningful. So in a way, the Shamada and Vipassana, learning the life skill. Yeah. And one of the very important life skill seems to the the skill of seeing uh, the truth in very, very simple things. We are so much easily drawn by, you know, for the uh, educated people, or educated people. <laughs> uh, <coughs> it seems that when you are talking about some very academic sounding, some intellectual things, uh, you are happy. So. It seems that you know, if people uh, start mastering this art of finding wisdom in very, very simple things, maybe they can also become more compassionate. You always teach us about bodhicitta. You talk about this aspiration bodhicitta and application bodhicitta. Maybe superficially to aspire to be very compassionate is rather easy, just in your aspiration. But to really act on that is not that comfortable. You have to come out from the comfort zone. Uh, once uh, you have to master the skill of dancing in a very, very balanced way between the absolute truth and the relative truth. Maybe this can also apply to developing compassion or developing uh, bodhicitta. Is that so? Is there an issue of balance which plays very, very important role in developing compassion within you? Yeah, of course. What Buddha said, <clears throat> like um, Nama Buddha in near Kathmandu, yeah. the one of the past life story of Buddha. Buddha was being born as a prince and he saw so mother tiger has many small tigers and the mother tiger doesn't have food yeah. she will die and if she die the all the baby cup baby tiger will die too and he thought wow to save this mother and the baby tiger he gave his body to the tiger and later buddha said that's the what i did in the past but don't do this if you are new practitioner of bodhicitta that may become obstacle for your path you need to find your own balance so finding balance is really important of course it's really important to develop love compassion and bodhicitta but when we bring into the action we need to follow a balance how much we can help that we have to check with our ability resource our strength of the mind according to that, that we need to help but we cannot help beyond our limit also that is too extreme or anyway i cannot help those let go of helping others also fall to the another extreme so try your best with your limitation and ability and the resource or whatever and special compassionate wisdom only love and compassion doesn't save the world we need to combine together with the wisdom a smart way to help others compassion and wisdom together as i mentioned before wisdom 
is the main practice, and the compassion is the method. Wisdom and method is the two wings of birth. Yes. And while we are doing that, deeper level we have to have wisdom. Wisdom is totally free, like emptiness, beyond subject and object. And suffering is is an illusion actually. Beings are in an illusion. I'm an illusion. Everything's emptiness. Actually, there's no suffering. There's no samsara. Then what are you afraid of, actually? So, the view is totally open. But your action has to be very fine. There is a karma in the relative level. And there is helping others. It's very important. Generosity is important. Discipline is important. Effort is important. Patience is important. So follow action level. Really good citizen, good person. Try your best to help others. But your deeper level, don't trap, don't trap with that. Don't cut up with that. Sometimes there's so many rules about action, what you do, what you should not do. This is the culture expected, this is the religion expected. Then in the end, oh, if I do this, problem, oh, dangerous, oh, bad karma, oh. Then you cannot free. You tied yourself. That's the other extreme. And another extreme, everything, don't care now, you know, independent. I have my freedom, don't care about the religion, don't care about the spiritual, don't care about the, my culture. Mm. Everything is emptiness. Now listen. <laughs> so we need to have find these two balance. Very free, open, fearless view with a fine, kind, compassion action together. I have got two questions regarding this Rinpoche. You know? uh, when you are practicing compassion, uh, just what you told just now, is that you have to be uh, responsible for your action and if you are not going to do really something but only you know thinking and thinking that's also bad uh, but uh, if you are trying to exhaust yourself too much that will also be bad yeah. now there are some some very realistic situation in our life like we see something bad being done you know there is a victim there is a perpetrator we automatically we are more kind more compassionate uh, we feel sorry for the victim and we want to help the victim and uh, if you want to help the victim sometimes you may have to fight the perpetrator also sometimes punish him, sometimes even kill, you know, to, to save so many people. So that becomes a very, very difficult situation. I think that now I have just started learning how to see the evil within myself. And I am also happy that when I see the evil within myself, that becomes weaker. That's good. But what do I do when I see the evil outside me? People are killing and small girls are being raped. There is so much, you know, exploitation happening. And you know, so much of, uh, you know, problem being faced by small children, women, Dalits, you know, other, other people and poor people. What do we do when we see this evil happening? The Mara outside yeah. us. Yeah. So, of course, normally we should support the victims. That's the uh, really important. But how to support that? With the compassion, with the wisdom. Sometimes what happens, we just follow the, our inner Mara. And we become the same as predator. Mm -hmm. So, thinking to save victims, and we choose the violence road. So then that is not the real kind way and wisdom way. Actually, in the end, it creates a lot of problems, more problems. 
and more destruction comes. For example, when we look at the world history, the dictators at the beginning they said, "Oh, we want to protect our country, our people." Uh, begin with a lot of good things and uh, good saying, but then what happened? The inner Mara is the the base that is keeping inside. Then in the end, what happened? War over one, over two. It's based on the people. They don't want to change themselves. They want to change the world. Hmm. I want to change yeah. the world. Then what happened? World become chaotic. But what the Buddha's way is, you should change Yourself. your inner world, your hmm. inner Mara first. So if we really transform ourselves, then there's a genuine influence comes. The real. So that influence, maybe you can influence. When you transform, you can transform your family members, your friends, your workers. Many times, people come to me and learn meditation, and they say, "Wow, this meditation technique is wonderful. Changing my life. How I can change my husband, my wife, my children, my parents? How I can teach them?" Then I told them, mm, "Don't teach. <laughs> Show them. If you go back." In your family or in your friends, so-called in your social circle, and you telling everybody to do this, we will not listen. Same as when we say no dalbar, more dalbar comes. But if they see you really transform, they will really curious, and they will look for why, and then that's really influence comes. Like now, the scientists said, what we learn, ninety. Two percent is based on non-verbal. Only seven percent, seven or eight percent, learn from the verbal. The other one is who you are. Being who you are, that we can learn. So therefore, if you transform, then at the same time, balancedly you want to help others. You want to radiate that whatever peace, wisdom that within you, to help others. It's very good. Otherwise, you may start a lot of social work, but based on inner Mara, in the end your social work become weapons of develop your own Mara, and there's a lot of conflicts, there's a lot of fightings, more fightings, more conflicts, more problems will come. So I think really important is to find the balance. Of course, we should follow the social injustice. Really important that the Buddha did that when he when he was alive. But what Buddha did is through love and compassion, through wisdom, not by following hatred, violence, violence, mm -hmm. anger. Mm -hmm. So don't allow yourself to be swept away by the current of your emotions. Yes. That will be like drowning in the river. Yeah. So first, try to wash the river yeah. from the bank. Yeah. Then, yeah. seeing that current of yeah. the river of your emotions, yes. Yes. then you decide. Yes. Don't be drowned yourself. Yes. Yeah. If you don't help your inner violence, you cannot help violence outside. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Another question related to this is that now. When you are talking about compassion, all of us now we know that the planet is being destroyed every moment because of our greed. We have started, you know, destroying our own planet, this beautiful planet, and trying to create another colony in the Mars. This, to me, sounds a little bit very. Odd. It's very difficult to understand. And uh, in Buddhist practice, the one of the most beautiful thing I found is that we are not only praying for ourselves, but we are always saying that may all sentient beings, you know, they have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the cause of hurt. So. 2,500 years ago, 
Siddharth Muni told us that we have to take care of all the sentient beings. But now, we are so proud of being humans, and not only proud, but we uh, think we are the rulers of the whole universe, and being so much human-centric, we have become ultra-humanist, and uh, not caring about the environment, not about the plants, not about the insects, not about bees, not about earthworms and things like that. So we want to dig something out immediately and consume it, you know, physically. So how should we use that knowledge that Buddha taught us to be compassionate, not only towards the yourself towards the human beings but also towards the every sentient beings even towards the planet and the stone and the earth and everything we do not follow this teaching from buddha now uh, what should we do rinpoche i think it's really important is again to connect with the balance so the world is based on individual we are the individual. So we need to transform our action according to our limit, according to our capacity. Then the world will change. The problem is if we want to change the world and that doesn't happen and we give up. What's the point? I'm just one person. Whatever I do it doesn't affect the entire world. Then give up. That is the also problem but if we are too tight on the and follow a lot of violence it may destroy the world again so Buddha what Buddha said the environment whatever you according to your own way whatever you can contribute whatever you can help the environment whatever you can help the world maintain that try that even small things if everybody do small things then the big thing happen automatically so so what i see in the past i met many social workers and many of them are exhausted in the end oh world is not changing and a lot of stress a lot of like panic depression and they cannot continue their work too tight. So I think for that, if they also practice the teaching of Buddha, the awareness, love and compassion, wisdom, and get more energy, more power, then it can help more to the society, more to the environment. So balance like this is very important. For example, I have, I'm here in the Kathmandu, in Mayo. There's some limited land here. I try my best to make a lot of trees plant. Even in a small area, plant a lot of trees. If one person plant three trees, yeah. if the three trees grow well, yeah. then there's a billions of trees comes in the in the world, right? So small effort like that is really important. Thank you, Rinpoche. That's that's uh, I think you know that will show the way, show the path to change yourself before trying to change others and to keep balance, uh, to see it very clearly, not be drowned in the emotions yourself, but to be able to see your own emotions and decide wisely. Thank you very much. Lastly, you know, I, I still, I have a rather, um, uh, a little bit difficult question that I am facing myself. When contemplating over anatma about no self, uh, there are so many questions I have faced. Like if you are not believing in the self or the soul, but you believe in rebirth, what is it that passes from one body to another body? There is something. Uh, I don't know it is right or wrong, but uh, I have tried to interpret as, you know, 
It is the mind stream which is ever-changing. It is not a solid, unchangeable, uh, ever-existing soul, but ever-changing wave-like movement that passes from uh, one body to other. Maybe it's like that. Uh, I don't know whether that's right. But after that, another question comes. Okay, I understand that, you know, that is where life thinks that there is no uh, fundamental soul, no ultimate soul or things like that. But then there is a continuity. Like, if this is me, I was a small child, that small child and now, the present me is not the same thing. But there is a continuity. I still say that that was my childhood. Mingyur Rinpoche, the previous Mingyur Rinpoche, and maybe the future Mingyur Rinpoche, you know. That is also a identity is there. Even Buddha, he had as a Siddhartha, as Buddha, as previous Buddhas, there is, well, I understand that there is no solid soul, no undestructible soul. But what is this identity? The continuity of the identity. So isn't that also some form of Atma, some form of Self? And this, I don't understand. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, our true nature is Buddha nature, and the Buddha nature is obscured by two layers. So outer layer, when we talk about self, we can say unhealthy sense of self, healthy sense of self, and self beyond self. So there's three, three, three layers there. The unhealthy sense of self is what we call clinging on permanent, single, independent. So permanent is not the impermanent, not the changing. We are perceiving ourselves actually permanent. Yesterday me, today me said. At the same time, we don't like to have unexpected surprise. But the surprise is expected. <laughs> so we are happy. But all the unexpected surprise is suffering. There's some kind of consistency, belief, holding. Everything should be like that way. Like if you go to toilet, you're waiting the line, and someone cut your line, boom! <laughs> now the <laughs> that unhealthy self explore. Maybe that person doesn't see you. Maybe that person has an emergency. Maybe that person not respect you. So many causes and conditions there. You can see. Maybe you can talk to them. Maybe if you're urgent, you should, they may understand you. Or maybe if they're urgent, you should let them. So many different ways, the cause and condition there. But we don't see normally. We just want to have everything as accordingly what we expected. So permanent, unhealthy self. And next is singularity, meaning my way is the best, number one. The scientific research that they interview the taxi drivers. More than 70% of taxi drivers said, my skill of driving is more than average. That is impossible. For example, if you're in the car, you and your friend, and the road is a little bit bumpy, then automatically we think, if I drive more safe. And that manifests in the social. My way is better. My party is better. My group is better. And the people who go into the game, you know, maybe cricket game, football game. If your party wins, you think, of course, they're the best. <laughs> if your party lost, Mm, maybe the other person trick. <laughs> maybe weather is not good that day. Yeah. Maybe judge is not good. <laughs> that singularity, sub-image, is very important. It's unhealthy, actually. 
So when we discuss in the group, my idea is the best. They don't listen to my way. Of course, it's a problem. I know from the beginning. <laughs> so that's the singularity. And number three, independent. Meaning we want to control everything. Everything has to be in my hand. If not controlled by me, it's a problem. These three combine together. Permanent, singularity, independent. And that is the Mara, actually. That is very touchy, egoistic. Don't care about others. Harm others, win myself. And that single, independent, permanent self actually not exist. Not exist even in the relative level. It's just conceptual level. So no matter what we call, like seeing double moon. There's no double moon in the sky. Not exist. Then there's healthy sense of self. Number two. Self with the changing. So maybe at home, your parents, husband, wife. At work, maybe your boss or staff. With the friend circle, your friend. Self is always changing. And self in the childhood now is changed. And the self sometimes happy in the morning and sometimes not happy in the evening. Sometimes good self, sometimes not so good self. Self is always changing. Understand that is healthy. And the second is multiplicity. You become you because your education, because your family background, because of your friend how you look at you, because your company, because of your body, because of your mind, because of your experience, because of your name. So many pieces there become you. Understand that is healthy. And third, they all are connected, not independent. Not everything is in your hand. It's interdependent. So from there, the compassion comes. Awareness comes. Wisdom comes. So that self is good. Then the last, self is emptiness. But emptiness doesn't mean nothing. Everything can manifest. So the true nature of self, beyond time, beyond matter, beyond subject and object, at the same time, everything can possible, can manifest. Self beyond self. So what is the continued? Unhealthy selves do not exist. Nothing continued, only the intellectual level. But healthy self is changed. That stream is continu continued. Stream of consciousness, stream of matter, Ma matter, stream of particles. The body is particle, mind is consciousness, continued. And that will continue like, like river, although it's changing, but there's a continuation. Therefore, we think the same river. So stream of mind, stream of body will continue. To. And that is healthy self. That is healthy self. To understand that, accept that. But even that is in the relative level. Yeah. So there's two relative. That is the healthy relative. Mm -hmm. True relative. Unhealthy is a fake relative. Like double moon. Mm. But then the real self is emptiness. Mm. On the ultimate level. Mm. Mm. That is empty, but not nothing. There's clarity. And, and clarity, potential. Yeah, clarity and potential. Clarity is the mind. Potential can manifest many different things. These two are one. So therefore, we are not nothing. Yet, we are not exist. <laughs> Thank you, Rinpoche. Thank you so much for this beautiful teaching conversation. I hope that this will help many people change to, to a better life, better lifestyle, and maybe we'll be able even to do something to save the planet. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. thank you very much for the wonderful question from you. And uh, I'm really happy to share this because I'm, I was born in Nepal in the uh, Gorkha, 
where we are slammed. <laughs> <laughs> and also Buddha also born in the Nepal. And I'm very happy to practice this um, our ancient uh, wisdom from the 2,600 years before until now. Unbroken wisdom, unbroken lineage, and to share this the Buddha's home country. So really happy.